Hi, my name's Kevin Henney, and I'm here to talk to you about six impossible things. Now, that idea of six impossible things comes from um, one of the Alice books, from Alice in Wonderland. Um, it's the first book, uh, Through the Looking Glass, is the second book uh, by Lewis Carroll. And the White Queen is asking Alice to believe in something that Alice says, well, I can't believe that, it's impossible. And uh, the Queen just dismisses that, says, sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> and I want to emphasise this idea of impossibility because we are often taught that nothing is impossible. And it just takes more time, more effort, um, anything is possible. But at the same time, we also sometimes brand something as impossible when actually it's just ridiculously hard and not feasible. That's not the same thing. If uh, you know, if you, somebody says, well, that's impossible, it would take a thousand years, then they've just told you the circumstances um, for its possibility. Um, so there is a distinction here. I'm actually interested in the things that are challenges um, that we can't meet directly. Oh, we may work around them, we may use our ingenuity, we may pull back um, and uh, innovate in other ways, but there are certain limits, limits defined by mathematics and physics um, that uh, we every now and then hit in software development. So I'm gonna count these down. Let's start at six. Representations can be inferred. Now, this is impossible. Now, you might say, well, hang on, surely I can get, I can represent infinity. You know, in my floating point numbers, I can do that, plus inf or minus infinity. Yeah, you're representing as a stand in for infinity, but it's not actually infinity. Um, there are no infinities in the physical universe. Infinity is a mathematical concept, not a physical one. Okay, that's not, so there's a distinction here. We are using a placeholder to say, mm, this thing is infinity. It's like infinity. It doesn't behave like infinity. It, not, it is not itself uh, infinity. It is much more bounded. There are also other concepts that lie beyond finiteness. So for example, not a number is, is not a finite uh, numeric concept. This is perhaps one of the most familiar to people um, in their day-to-day -day use of applications in the web. Um, we get thrown back with NAN. It's not a number. <coughs> Sometimes it's as frustrating as not being able to complete um, a flight booking. And other times it can be a little more dramatic. Um, this happened in 2020 um, and uh, uh, driverless race cars uh, uh, drives into a wall. And what had happened um, is during the initialization lap, something had happened which caused the steering control signal to go to NAN and subsequently the steering locked the maximum value to the right. So this was a bit of a state management issue. It was interesting when I tweeted this originally, um, uh, somebody had uh, pointed out to me, you know, oh, wait a minute, are you saying that these applications that they use um, JavaScript? And it's like, well, no, no that's not, not, not at all what we're saying. Um, um, NAN is used outside the realm of JavaScript. Um, uh, it comes from IEEE 754 and IEEE 854 standards. Um, so this is the 1980s. Uh, we see NAN errors uh, all over the place. But JavaScript, thanks to its um, long-standing idea that there is only one um, uh, uh, one numeric type, and it's a very uh, well, it's a very atypical numeric type, floating point. Uh, 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 type is, is its only way of expressing numbers historically. It's a limitation to do with that. And that therefore is very public facing. Now, when it comes down to floating point representations, um, there was a piece in 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know, a piece by Chuck Allison uh, called Floating Point Numbers Aren't Real. And he makes this observation. There's, and this, this is important because real numbers have infinite precision and are therefore continuous and non-lossy. In fact, real numbers are uncountably infinite. Between zero and one, there are an infinite number of numbers and we are not able to represent them all. All we are ever gonna do is approximation. Floating point numbers are that approximation. They have limited precision, so they are finite and they resemble badly behaved integers. And I think that's a lovely way of putting it. These are badly behaved integers. They, they don't behave as you would expect. 
But it's a little more, uh, it's a little more than that, because it is not simply that they are badly behaved integers. Integers are not always that well behaved either. One of the things that we learn is that most um, most languages present us with integers that are unlike true integers. True integers are unbounded. They are countably infinite. A 32-bit integer is not countably infinite. It is countably finite. And we see it thrust into our faces every now and then. So here's one from a few years ago, Visual Studio, telling me that my license will explore, uh, it will expire in, in about 2 billion days. And that number if you're outside software development, you come from outside software development, that looks just like an arbitrarily large number. If you're a software developer, you look at that and go, oh yeah, that's 2 to the 31 minus 1. That is the maximum value of a signed 32-bit int. That's a little bit suspicious. But we can also see there's something else going on here as well. So somehow something got set to int max value. But also notice your license has gone stale and must be updated. Well, Surely that's not right. I mean, my license is good for a few hundred thousand years. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm good here. Clearly, the number that is being used for comparison is different. And so this is likely to be something that um, uh, manifests in the presentation layer rather than, uh, rather than in the core. But it does confront us with the boundedness and the limitations, as it were. In errors, we tend to find uh, we confront um, the uh, finiteness of our machines. We might be tempted to try and prove things. OK, there are limits to proofs and there are limits to the practicality of proofs. But there's also something else in when we talk about um, the limits of proof. And this was inadvertently highlighted in a, um, a piece by John Bentley, uh, 1983. Um, during the 80s, uh, John Bentley had a column in uh, communications, the SEM, Programming Pearls. And these were collected um, in a number of books, Programming Pearls, more Programming Pearls. And then there was a second edition of Programming Pearls in the 90s. And this one, which you can find in the first edition, Writing Correct Programs, in fact, you can find it online if you want to Google for it, <coughs> is interesting because he presents a, he, he presents a binary search algorithm. He presents binary search algorithm and proves that it is correct. And here's the pseudocode that he presents for it. And we can see there's an interesting of note, there is a three-way partition in that case. There's a three-way partition in terms of the comparison. Then he annotates this more completely. And all of those things in curly brackets that say must be, basically must be is an assertion. It is a, it's an invariant, a thing that must be true at that point. And he uses this to demonstrate the correctness of this algorithm. And one of the major benefits of program verification is that it gives programmers a language in which they can express that understanding. And we should always be on the lookout for opportunities to in, improve our vocabulary, our ways of expressing um, and uh, understanding certain problems. More different points of view can be very helpful. But he also observes this is not the be all and end all. These techniques are only a small part of writing correct programs. Keeping the code simple is usually the way to correct this. He also highlights another aspect where our emphasis is drawn, where our attention is drawn. Several professional programmers familiar with these techniques have related to me an experience that is too common in my own program. When they construct a program, the hard parts work first time, while the bugs are in the easy parts. And this is, you've probably had this experience, you know it. You're so focused on the bit that you know is hard. You put so much attention, you manage the detail and you get it right. You completely overlook something else that's been invalidated or something else that should have been changed in conjunction with a more complex thing. And this kind of demonstrates to us that we have a blind spot, but that blind spot is in fact deeper than what he's described. Here is code from the Java libraries. This is in the uh, binary search um, uh, uh, method that is found in the collections uh, kind of utility class and is developed by Josh Block. Josh Block was a student of John Bentley and Josh is using, you can see the three-way partition in there. Um, Josh Block is using the, um, uh, the approach that Bentley proved was correct. And you know what? This works just fine until you use a very large array. And this is the point. Very large arrays did not really exist 
in the 1980s and the 1990s. This is why this bug was only found and reported in 2006. There's a problem here. In any binary search, no matter how you're doing it, you're going to end up with uh, trying to establish the midpoint. Okay, binary search is about searching between midpoints and kind of halving the distance appropriately. And the intuitive way that works with integers is that you take the low point you've been searching, the high point, and by you find the midpoint, you add the two together and you divide by two. It's the arithmetic mean. And that's fine. There's only one problem. This is Java. Java doesn't have integers. It has ints. Ints are truncated. They are not countably infinite. They are countably countable. Now, they are countably finite. Um, if you have a large value that is low and a high value that is low, when you add the two together, they won't make a very large number. They'll make a very negative number. And that's the point. You simply didn't have arrays that were going to be this kind of size. You did not have arrays that were going to have two gigs worth of um, entries until you did. So what we end up with is this assumption. This assumption was that ints behave like integers, and they don't. Uh, the one thing we know is that ints are not integers. They, they actually follow a different form of arithmetic. Majority of the operations on the most of the time behave like integers, but they're not integers. We fooled ourselves. And it's so easy to fall in that habit. The fix is, is relatively simple. What you do is you find the distance between the low and the high, you halve that, and then you add that to the low point. And so we can see in the original proof that the assumption is here. He is assuming that he is using integers, but he's not. He's using integer division, yeah, on integers, yeah, except that that's not what's actually going on. We find other confrontations with the boundedness of numbers, and again, back to infinity. This is the USS Yorktown. Uh, it's a US uh, Navy cruiser that's uh, since been decommissioned. But in uh, 1998, um, it basically was dead in the water for about 48 hours. Um, so was the problem. Um, they, uh, they made a change um, uh, from a Unix to Windows installation. And sometimes people, and this was originally published under the issue of like problems with Windows. Actually, it was not a problem with Windows uh, specifically. I'll get to that in a moment. The source of the problem on the Yorktown was the data contained a zero where it shouldn't have been. And when the software attempted to divide by zero, which is a big no, remember, there are no infinities, a buffer overrun occurred. Yeah, big time. Crashing the entire network and causing the ship to lose control of its propulsion system. Now, divide by zero is something that it's not going to crash Windows. Um, most likely what this is, um, given that this was networking software, this is probably the driver and it runs in kernel mode. That is what caused the problem. This was a custom driver, and Windows do not have sufficient defenses and nor the driver for dealing with this. So as Shakespeare observed, this is the monstrosity in love, that the will is infinite and the execution is confined. The desire is boundless and the act a slave to limit. There are no infinite representations. Coming to number five, not every question has an answer. Okay, it turns out we can ask more questions than we can get answers to. And to demonstrate this, um, many years ago, back before Facebook was busy destroying democracy, um, I submitted um, a bug report to Facebook and I was told that my feedback would be used to improve Facebook. That did not apparently happen, but thanks for taking the time to make a report. How much time? Well, that took me back quite a way. Okay, um, 31st of December, 1969. Now that, that seems kind of familiar. That's really close to another number. What we need to understand is that if you're a full stack developer, and I mean a real full stack developer, I'm not a JavaScript developer who does front end and talks to a database. Full stack, the full stack, if you're a full stack developer, you know how to program in C. The full stack is really deep. Everything is ultimately built on C at that level. And the time function in C, um, what does it measure? What does it respond in? Well, on most platforms that use time, that have time, the implementation is based on POSIX. And the POSIX standard says the time function shall return the value of the time in seconds since epoch. When is epoch? Well, this is really easy to find. It's actually quite a popular class of errors. Um, you can actually find that out. What is time when it is zero? Well, it's the 1st of January, 1970. Okay, and stroke of midnight that leads you into that. Now, it's fairly unlikely that Intel were distributing drivers on the 1st of January, 1970 um, uh, for Windows operating systems. So 
this is a classic zero initialization fault. That is what I thought had gone on, a zero initialization fault, and then a time zone shift. I'm based in the UK. Facebook is American, therefore that's West, and I was negative time-wise from where I am. So therefore I assumed a negative time adjustment. So that would give you zero initialization and then um, back into 31st of December. But actually there is another explanation that in more recent years I've come to kind of consider as more plausible. Going back to the C standard, time, the value of minus one is returned from time if the calendar time is not available. Now that might seem initially, well, hang on, how can the time not be available? Surely time is always available. And that's, that's the shortfall here. No, it isn't. Time is a service. It can fail just like anything else. When you involve time in your application, it's not some kind of global variable that's asynchronously updated that you can call from a static method anywhere. APIs that do that are slightly misleading. You're actually coupling to an external dependency. And like anything that involves that, like accessing a net, uh, anything across the network, that's subject to failure. It's not common that you'll get that failure, but that's not what we're discussing here. We're not discussing frequency, we're discussing possibility. And it is quite possible that minus one is returned. And if minus one is returned, then that will be interpreted as one second before midnight, which will give you 1969. Now, another area of interest when we talk about this stuff is, is algorithms. Now, you know, algorithms, for people who've done computer science degrees, they, they've, they've kind of done algorithms to death. But what is it? Because the word is widely misused these days in association and widely misused and overgeneralized um, as something intrinsically nefarious related to machine learning. It, it's nothing more complex and, you know, it's, it's quite innocent. Uh, it, it's a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem solving operations, especially by a computer. Now, to make, a, make things a little more exciting, if you are sick to death of computer science and sorting algorithms, let's have fun with esoteric algorithms. I've been writing about esoteric algorithms on my blog post on and off for a while. Um, sleep sort, drop sort, and this one's permutation sort. Um, permutation sort, the complexity of this thing, it, it, I mean, it's grossly inefficient. It has factorial time complexity. Um, it's shocking. Um, we can consider it, it's a systematic but unoptimized search through the permutations of the input values until it finds the one arrangement that is sorted. So for 10 elements, that's potentially um, 3 million comparisons that it's going to perform. Okay, this is hugely inefficient. It's also great fun. It's, it's also a useful provocation. Um, it's not something you'd ever put into um, production code, except perhaps if somebody says, well, if you ask them, Hey, what are your performance crimes? Oh, we have no performance crimes. Hey, use permutation sort. I bet you, if you use permutation sort, that person will discover they do indeed have performance requirements. It's just they didn't know what they were. They didn't know the boundary. Demonstrate where the boundary is. So let's do this in Groovy. I need to work out whether or not something is sorted. Okay, I've got a, I've got a simple predicate function here. That figures out. That's great. Now, here's permutation sort. Permutation sort, I can just use the permutation generator. Um, I use a permutation generator that will systematically um, return me um, an iterator. Uh, permutation generator is iterable. And all I do is I just keep on going. You know, if it's sorted, then I return the permutation, otherwise keep on going. Um, so there's kind of a uh, there's kind of a thought here that, you know, surely there can be nothing worse than permutation sort in terms of performance. Yeah, don't be so sure. Um, so I recently um, wrapped up on writing about bogus sort. Um, bogus sort is kind of interesting because bogus sort is not systematic. Bogus sort takes a slightly different approach. It just randomly shuffles, not systematically. It randomly shuffles and checks whether or not something's sorted. So we might naively write it like this while it's not sorted, then shuffle the values. But that does give a free pass if the values are already sorted. So we're going to do a shuffle first. Okay, here's where we definitely get terrible performance. Because this is kind of interesting. We're just going to randomly shuffle it. Is it, is it good? No. It's like throwing a deck of cards up into the air. And does it land? Is it sorted? No. Okay, throw it again. Now, that kind of gives you a sense of the possibility um, that this is not the most efficient way to do things. 
Now we might have some of might some have some objections and concerns. Say, well, actually, Kevin, technically you are systematically generating it because you're using pseudo random numbers rather than real random numbers. Okay, that, that, that that's a fair objection, but not one that is easily it's not one sustained for very long. Um, we can have access to um, true random numbers through the entropy uh, of your hardware, um, and the way that this works, say, in, on the Java platform, uh, you use secure random, and that. Uh, uses a pseudo random number generator that is seeded off. So there's one, one time where we use a number that is truly random. Um, when not doing this, people often use time, but time is not random. Um, uh, although there are days it feels like that. Time is not random, um, but you're guaranteed that, um, uh, that secure random will give you something that is seeded in something that is as truly random as can be um, got from the hardware. But we have a kind of potential objection. Is this now an algorithm? Is this still an algorithm? So why would I question that? Because an algorithm is a specific procedure. Well, I've been very non-specific. Randomness is not specific. We've actually said there's a completely non-specific part here. But there is actually a deeper and more subtle objection. Procedure which always terminates is called an algorithm. It's not guaranteed to terminate. This could actually genuinely never ever terminate, which is kind of interesting. There is no guarantee that our sequence will, the sorted sequence it will appear. Of course, the probability is so close to zero that it probably isn't even actually representable in a floating point number. And every time I've ever implemented BOGO sort, it has always terminated. Um, but then how would I wait for the end of the universe or beyond? Um, so here's a question, how do we test all this? And this is kind of a, a demonstration of, um, this is the origin of a, a very popular quote that's on structured programming, it's 50 years, um, 50 years ago this year it was published. Dijkstra's very uh, popular quote, program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence. Um, it kind of, it does demonstrate that we have this challenge. How do I demonstrate that this will always be correct? Or rather will always terminate. So here's a very simple example based test case. Every time I've ever run it, it certainly passes. Um, I've taken a sequence of values. I tell you what the expected ones are. I BOGO sort it and I test the values I get are the expected ones. But how do I guarantee? I want to be able to guarantee that this terminates. How, how can I do that? Well, I can't do it in the algorithm. Maybe I can, maybe I can have the test kind of enforce that and basically say, you know, fail the test if it runs forever. Okay. Hmm. Do we do it like this? Well, that's not going to work either because it turns out that there is no, there is, it's not just the case that there is no end of time. Um, it's not just the case that, um, that we don't have that constant available to us in J unit. It's that it doesn't actually mean anything. Um, you know, if we reach the end of time, then fail the test because the, the algorithm didn't terminate. You realize that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So we just, choose pragmatism, a thousand milliseconds. Yeah, that runs typically within a second, that's fine. Now, what we've done though is we've been pragmatic. We've also demonstrated that another reason there are no infinities, it's not just that physics doesn't uh, tolerate them, is that we, our patients won't. It also teaches us how to solve things like the, the halting problem that is related to termination. We can fix that very easily by putting timeouts in. And indeed, that is how we address these problems. Where we are not guaranteed to ever receive an answer, what we do is we exchange the non-determinism of not knowing whether we receive an answer for the non-determinism uh, of we receive an answer or we get told it timed out. So in other words, we replace, we offer certainty. We offer certainty in time, but we trade it for certainty in result. And that's why timeouts exist. Now, related is this is another um, impossibility. Every truth can be established where it applies. What we were saying here is basically it's related to Gödel's incompleteness theorems. Adrian Collier did a really nice summary of this in a piece on fairness in machine learning. And he highlights that, common with a number of other things, the beginning of the 20th century, there was this optimism that physics and mathematics will be completely known. And particularly in the light of the proof from Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead in Principia Mathematica, um, they, uh, they had the goal of providing a solid foundation for all of mathematics. Um, 
20 years later, Kurt Gödel shattered the dream, showing for any consistent axiomatic system, there will always be theorems that cannot be proven within that system within that system. In other words, to prove those theorems, you have to step outside that. In other words, there are statements that are true that cannot be proven to be true within that context. Summarized differently, um, um, in Gödel, Escher, Bach, and perhaps a little more formally, um, all consistent axiomatic formulations of number theory include undecidable propositions. Now, many people might say, well, that's great, Kevin, fine. Undecidable propositions, fine. Axiomatic formulations in number theory, fine. But I'm, I'm dealing with code here, okay? Turns out, guess what? Code is uh, equivalent to such a formulation. So yes, everything that applies here applies to our code. There are undecidable propositions in code dependent on the context. So let me demonstrate that. Um, let's try and determine how long a piece of string is. To be precise, let's measure the length of a string in C. Okay, so Standard function for this in C is strlen. Back in the days before we had vowels um, and, and sufficiently long identifiers, and what we've got is size t. That is a size. That is an integer type, an unsigned integer type uh, that is used for sizes. And char star as so. This is a pointer to the beginning of the sequence of of characters. Okay, and a string in C is delimited by a null. When we reach that null, we are done. We have measured the whole length of the string. So. We go ahead, we measure it, we set it up. Um, we start with uh, our result, it's zero, while um, the nth position from S does not equal a null character, increment the count, return the count. We are done. This implementation is actually very similar to the one that you'll find um, in uh, Kerning and Ritchie's C programming language, and I've uh, retained most of the um, uh, uh, naming conventions from there. What truths can we establish? What must be necessary for this to work? Well. Here's one. That pointer cannot be null. See, I can assert that. And here's another one. For this to work in a way that is defined, there must exist an n such that there is a null, and that every point between the beginning and that position n are valid and, ide and, and are well defined in the context of C. In other words, you're not wandering across garbage memory and technically stuff that is undefined um, and inaccessible. You will notice that this is in gray and also uses a bunch of symbols that are not native to C. That is because you cannot actually write this in C. It is not actually something you can assert on. It is not possible within the context of Strelen to prove that it has, um, that it can uh, uh, behave correctly. So that's kind of a really kind of simple way of looking at it. And we can actually see this in practice. We can change the context. I can demonstrate by changing the context, stepping outside Strelen into a test case here. And here I'm going to present it with a valid string, B excellent to each other. Um, S is, it, I'm going to print out how long it is. I'm going to print a string and how long it is. And here we go, a B excellent to each other, 26 characters. Great. Um, I can demonstrate the correctness of that just by inspection and stepping outside and by execution. Now here, we're not gonna provide enough space. I'm only gonna provide five characters of space. In other words, not enough space for the null. And actually C will allow you to write it in this form. We're not gonna get the null. When I run it, actually there's a reasonable chance it will show five because memory may be null. But the fact that it did work is not a guarantee that it should work. I mean, equally well, you could be cast into the void heading towards the Galaxy M87. Similarly, there is the idea that Actually, maybe the pointer itself is uninitialized. Well, that's just garbage. And there you are finding it inside a black hole in M87. So the point there is not, it's not defined. And there is, there is no way to demonstrate the correctness of this inside the context of Strelen. Well, I can do it by inspection with static analysis outside there. Now, why is this relevant? Um, because a lot of people work in managed languages and they're thinking, well, I don't need to worry about that kind of undefined behavior. Well, there are cases you can replicate or you can demonstrate that kind of girdle problem um, in other cases. But actually just always remember that in any large system, there is always gonna be an element that is touching the void in this respect. Um, and in this uh, piece um, by uh, Thomas Ronson in 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know that uh, Trisha G and I edited a couple of years back, um, Thomas looks through and says, well, how, do I, how can I show that something, uh, you know, how can I crash my JVM? How can I crash my incredibly well managed my, my managed uh, environment? And in most cases, it's by stepping outside that. It's the stepping outside context. As he says, write some native code, all the syntax of C, all the safety of C. 
Um, but this is bigger than just that. As Adrian observes, uh, one premise of many models of fairness in machine learning is that you can measure, that was prove fairness in machine learning, um, a machine learning model from within the system, from the properties of the model itself or perhaps the data it's trained on. However, we know we can't. To show a machine learning model is fair, you have to step outside. You need information from outside the system. And this is also important for many of the metrics that we fool ourselves with. Um, this is a wonderful demonstration of this. Um, what you're looking at is 99 secondhand um, uh, uh, phones um, that are running Google Maps. And in uh, 2020, the first wave of lockdowns, Simon Verkert in Berlin um, wandered around Berlin and created virtual traffic jams. Um, now notice I'm using the word virtual traffic jam, just as is uh, reported there on his website, virtual traffic jam, because that's not a traffic jam, is it? Google Maps can't tell you where there's a traffic jam. It's not possible for Google Maps to do that. What it's possible for it to do is to try and establish a correlate between traffic jams and the presence of phones, and therefore to determine, ah, oh, you know what? There's a lot of phones moving very slowly, and they're all in navigation mode. There's a lot of phones moving slowly, and um, yeah, therefore that that correlates with um, that correlates with a traffic jam. But notice I'm using the word correlation; it's not causal. So what they're doing is they're doing it. now. You know, a lot of the time it's going to show you where the traffic jams are but some of the time it's not. And this is a reminder. How many people are measuring engagement? I know what engagement is. My dictionary knows what engagement, engagement is. It's the state of being engaged. It's emotional involvement or commitment. Is that what people are measuring? You've got whole marketing departments trying to nudge up an engagement value. They're not measuring engagement. They need to stop using that word. We don't know whether or not people are engaged. In fact, I'm, the, the, the correlations are actually far weaker. This is engagement. We don't know how long people are spending um, actually looking at a screen. You can tell when somebody's moved off to another screen, but you don't know what they were doing before that unless you're doing eyeball tracking. You know, that's a security issue. Let's not, let's not worry about that. The point there is I had this, I had this exactly yesterday. I was on a web page that I was on for a few seconds and I was going to go to another web page, but the doorbell went. I received a delivery. So for two minutes, I was not at my screen. There is an engagement statistic, engagement statistic somewhere that tells people that I was on that page for two minutes and 30 seconds. No, I wasn't. I was on that page for 30 seconds. The minute I got back down, I moved up to another page. People are measuring clicks and shares, and that's what they need to understand. They're not measuring engagement. Engagement should always appear in quotes. We must be careful not to confuse data with the abstractions we use to analyze them. We do not always know the answers to the questions in the context in which they are answered. We do not know that that is a traffic jam. We do not know that that is engagement. We do not know whether or not this is actually a valid call to a particular method in a particular context. And we cannot necessarily prove this machine learning system is fair by using all the assumptions that we put in to that machine learning system. We need to step outside that to demonstrate that, see the bigger picture. Now, when we look to the bigger picture, let's also look to the future. Here is something that's impossible. The future is knowable before it happens. Now, that kind of seems kind of obvious. But we trip over that. Often we do so because we don't appreciate the degree to which software development is actually an exercise in applied philosophy. It's about epistemology. It is about the nature of knowledge. As Grace Hopper observed, to me, programming is more than an important practical art. It is also a gigantic undertaking in the foundations of knowledge. In essence, a code base is a codification of knowledge. It's a codification of the knowledge that we have about the problem domain and the solution domain, bound together and expressed in a way that is formally executable. It's a formal specification of this knowledge. And so therefore, knowledge is the heart of everything that we do. But that means we have to have good models of what we know and what we don't know. Likewise, what, we, what correlates versus what is causal what we know versus what we don't know. There are things that we know we know. There are things that we know that we don't know. Then it starts getting a little more exciting. There are things we don't know we don't know. These are often assumptions. You know, those are the things that people, that are hidden until you, until you have them contradicted. Oh, 
I had assumed that at that moment, you discovered you had an assumption. You had the assumption all along. But if anybody had asked you before, what are your assumptions? That thing, whatever it was that was contradicted in future, was, was not known to you. You did not know you had the assumption. And then you cannot find out. You have no process for knowing. These things are unknowable until they happen. Unknowable unknowns are the challenge here. The halting problem, for example. Um, I cannot know whether or not something is going to terminate until it doesn't terminate. But hang on, I don't have a process for that. Oh, huh, yeah. So I can't tell that future. We have this observation that prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. It's probable that Niels Bohr actually said this, but there are other contenders. And I find that interesting and fascinating because this is in the past, this quote was made, and we don't know who said that. If we don't know this about the past, how on earth are we going to be able to know about the future? Now, we try and tackle the future in various ways. Now, here's a roadmap. In fact, this is a template for roadmap. You can go online, you can go to Google and find out PowerPoint templates for roadmaps. There's, there's many of them, and lots of them use road images. But invariably, they suffer from one problem. I don't have a problem with the roadmap metaphor. I have a problem with the fact that people don't use it correctly. Uh, let me show you a real roadmap. Um, this is Bristol. This is where I live. There's more than one road. And that, that's kind of important because that's the point of a roadmap. If I only have one road, I don't really need a roadmap. People are misusing the metaphor. The metaphor is much more exciting when you show the different branches and possibilities. Because if you don't show those, it means apparently you know how to predict the future. I'm guessing that this particular PowerPoint template dates back to 2018. Of particular interest here is 2020. Somebody here had a roadmap that included 2020. How many of you people out there had roadmaps for 2020 back in 2018? And how many of them said global pandemic changes everything about the nature of our work and how we work and how our clients interact with us and how global markets work and even the business of going to the shops? I'm pretty sure that nobody had that down. That was not knowable until it happened. But it doesn't take a pandemic to highlight this. People are doing this, making this mistake all the time. They, I hear often when people got, you know, they're talking about the requirements. They talk about prioritizing by business value. That sounds great. Sounds very positive. I mean, we're trying to focus on the business. There's only one problem. Um, you can't do it. And I'm not saying, let's be very clear. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm saying you can't do it. That's a very different statement. You can't do it because it's impossible. You don't know what the business value of something is unless you travel into the future and then travel back. It's the traveling back bit that's hard. We're traveling into the future all of the time. It's the traveling back that's the hard part. That's why you can't prioritize by business value. You are always using an estimate. It's prioritizing by estimated business value. Now you might say, oh, Kevin, you're just picking on words. It's just semantics. You're right, it is just semantics. Semantics is meaning. If you don't say what you mean, how are people supposed to know? If you, have, if, you are, if you are in the business of confusing estimates with actuals, we need to have a serious conversation because you cannot prioritize by business value. You can prioritize by estimated business value. And that's a little more interesting. I'm asking you to change the way you work. As, as the great Grace Hopper said, humans are allergic to change. They love to say we've always done it that way. You know, I try to fight that. So I have a clock on my wall that runs counterclockwise. It's also, by the way, why I have Grace Hopper is uh, the reason I have a clock on my wall that does this. And it's good for messing with people's minds, um, but it breaks an assumption. Now, another impossibility that people often don't realize they're making, but they often do it when they're talking about data consistency. And indeed, many things about distributed um, systems, when people sort of assume, oh, we want, you know, we want the markets in Hong Kong. We want the data that we have um, here in Europe to be the same as the data that we have in Hong Kong and in Singapore um, within a few milliseconds, not realizing that the speed of light means that that's actually not going to be possible. We have limits to what is knowable within a distributed system. Now, Leslie Lamport kind of captured the essence of what it is to be uh, to have a distributed system many years ago. Um, it's uh, A distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. It reminds us of the physicality and limitations um, of various systems. But it goes further than just a little bit of humor. Um, formulated, um, Eric Brewer formulated this. Originally, it was a principle. Um, it eventually got proven. It's better known these days as the CAP theorem. And 
it basically identifies three things, three qualities, three behaviors that we are interested in. Consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Consistency, it's about the data. Consistency is the idea that every time you request a value for a piece of data, you will receive the most recent value or you will receive an error. We all receive the same answer or we receive, I'm sorry, that wasn't available right now. Availability is every request for such data will receive an answer, but you're not guaranteed it's the latest answer. And partition tolerance, partition is a fancy way of saying, you know, it's, <laughs> I have one, I started with one network, now I've got two. In other words, um, basically message loss um, for whatever cause. And the point there is you can have two out of three of these, but never all three. And that was proven 20 years ago. You can have things be consistent. I'm going to give you the right answer or I'm going to give you an error, um, uh, an error status in the event of um, any kind of failures. I can always give you an answer. I can give you the last cached version in the event of failure. There's also the interesting case that actually I can demonstrate you can have the right answer and everybody else has the right answer all at once, but there is no tolerance for failure. Now, that's actually the limiting case of, you know, it's, it, it is viable when you're running in a single process. If you like, the CAP theorem is kind of a Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for distribution. Um, it's sort of captured nicely. Um, all of these things are captured at a sort of level by Douglas Adams. Um, we demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty, and indeed we have these. But we need to understand where these are, uh, because there are a number of cases where we find that we are being given inconsistent things, and there's no reason for it. I, you often get this, you know, sort of, you, you'll see something that says, you have a message that says, you have four messages in your inbox, or you have four things in your um, uh, uh, scheduled post queue, or you have, whatever it is, you have four of them, and then you look at the screen, and it shows five. Well. Clearly, one of these numbers is wrong, and it's clearly the four. There are clearly five. And all you have to do is take the length of that. Now, how do we end up with such a mess? Because that's nothing to do with distribution or eventual consistency. That's to do with the fact that we've got front ends. In a front end, you are in a, you are in a system that can be consistent. And this is maybe a side effect of people using micro front ends or whatever, but this is nothing to do with the limitations of a distributed system. It's, it's, it's just limitations of poorly designed client side. Um, uh, code and this is this bit is solvable. So the last point that I want to um, focus on is technical debt that is actually quantifiable as financial debt. People often do this. It's not possible. It's not just that it's not right. I mean, it's also not right. In other words, it's intent. It's actually also not possible. We understand that systems can become more complex through compromises through the nature of time. Um, Maya Lehman captured this elegantly enough um, in 1980. As an evolving program has continually changed, its complexity reflecting deteriorating structure increases unless work is done to maintain or reduce it. There are lots of different ways of talking about our systems and the quality of the abstract natures. We use different metaphors. And the metaphor here, the Martin Fowler helped popularize, um, came originally from Ward Cunningham. Technical debt is a wonderful metaphor developed by Ward Cunningham to help us think about this problem. And Ward came up with it in 1992. He didn't actually call it technical debt. He just said, we can imagine this is basically like debt. Um, and there's a parallel here. Like financial debt, the technical debt incurs interest payments, which come in the form of the extra effort that we have to do in future development because of the quick and dirty design choice. Or it doesn't have to be quick and dirty. It can be quite appropriate, uh, but it's limited by uh, the extent of our knowledge. But we need to remind ourselves it's a wonderful metaphor. It's a metaphor. I find people taking it a little bit too literally. I find myself cautioning against the category error of treating the technical debt metaphor literally and numerically, converting co-quality into a currency value on a dashboard. Oh, that's a disastrous thing to do. It's like the bad stats we talked about earlier. First of all, you cannot know what that value is financially. Let's be very clear, if, at best, you're only ever going to end up with an estimate of the debt. But there are reasons even this is not the right way of looking at it, because it is based on a fallacy and a misunderstanding. I mean, if you can find the conversion rate, well done for you. 
And I have had people tell me, oh, no, no, we, we, we do that. Yeah, if you've, got a fa- if you've got a currency value, and there are tools that will give you a currency value, honestly, you know, um, there are people that will, you can pay them money and they will tell you what your future is. <laughs> Don't be taken in by this. It's nonsense. Um, it's bad science answered based on a deep misunderstanding. And when people have said, oh, no, we, we have an estimate, and they've used the word estimate, well done then. We have an estimate, and it's not in currency values, it's in hours, hours of work in order to repay that debt. They've made a slight category error there. Technical debt is, they're assuming technical debt is the cost of repaying the debt. The problem is technical debt is not the cost of repaying the debt. Technical debt is the cost of owning the debt. And that was what all of the wording that Martin added and Ward added and many other people added, but has been lost in the kind of like the, the, the kind of the, the, the excitement of, hey, maybe we can use a number for this. Be careful. The message of the technical debt metaphor is not simply a measure of the specific work needed to repay the debt. It is the additional time and effort added to all the past, present, and future work that comes from having the debt in the first place. The burden of debt is not momentary. It's not now. It is across all of these spans of time. How how much did it cost you in the past? And then again, the future, how much will it cost you in the future? And that value may be large, or it may indeed turn out to be zero, something you can write off. Which brings us to the end of six impossible things. These are not the only impossible things. There are other impossible things that I have hinted at. I have not fully explored the halting problem. I have not fully explored the question of the speed of light limiting certain behaviors in distributed systems um, uh, and so on. But it should give you a taster of this idea that sometimes we need to step outside a little bit and look for things um, and look at things from a different angle. That that may spur on innovation. It may uh, may allow us to be creative, but it may also give us creative questions. Thank you very much for your time.